What is going on, guys? It is a Saturday afternoon here on the East Coast. I am the Solid Monster. This is your WWE Elimination Chamber 2024 review. Might I start start out with uh, letting you know my thoughts on Peacock? The hell with Peacock. Have I said that before that I don't like Peacock? You know, they have this as a 5 a.m. start time. 2 a.m. on the West Coast. All the time zones were all different for the show here. And I naively thought, well, if I don't tune in exactly at 5, if I tune in at 6, if I tune in at 7, I could just rewind back to the beginning and I could start the pay-per-view from the beginning. No! No, 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 no. That's not the way Peacock works. And so I learned that the hard way here. And I can't understand how, in 2024, if the show is barely midway through, I don't understand why you can't just track back to the beginning and start from the very first match. Is the technology with Peacock not up to speed enough that you can do that? Because that seems very foolish to me. But I just look for reasons to hate on Peacock anyway, because I hate the UI, and I just think it's a generally shitty fucking service. So, fuck Peacock. I just wanted to get that out of the way here first. But Elimination Chamber is in the books. A very newsworthy show, headlined by the Women's World Championship on the line, Rhea Ripley defending her title in her homeland against Nia Jax. I've been wondering if they were going to headline with this. I said, I wonder. I wonder if they might go ahead and they might give us the Rhea Ripley match here at the end of the show, especially if a heel was going to go over in the men's chamber match, because it was going to be one of those two. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. It worked out exactly that way. Uh, it was the best match of Nia Jax's career. I will give her that. And I say that not to insinuate that it was Rhea Ripley who carried her to the best match of her career. Rhea Ripley had a lot to do with that, but they both went out there and they had what I thought was a good main event. It was a good kind of old school main event where you had the champion going in there and it was a rare occurrence where the champion went in there as the underdog. 
And Rhea Ripley is generally not the underdog in any of her matches, but tonight she was. I say tonight, today. Today she was. But she went in there with Nia Jax. They had a very good main event, I thought, for what uh, I was expecting out of them. It was perfectly fine. And you had Rhea Ripley working as the babyface, which you knew coming in she was going to. That's the entire reason why her match was in the main event on this show. They knew that you can't send Rhea Ripley out there in Perth and get her booed. And she was out there being treated as one of the biggest baby faces in the entire company. Nia's job was to go in there and play the role of heel. That is the one thing that she has done better than anything else since they have brought her back. And she has had some good matches since she's come back. The match with Becky Lynch on day one, on the very first episode of Raw this year, was also very good. Now, she has the benefit of working with people who are better than her, who have been around longer than her doing this. Nia was gone for a while there before she came back, but I will give Nia Jax credit because she went out there tonight and did exactly what she needed to do. But the outcome was never in doubt. Nia Jax was not headlining and winning and then defending the title at WrestleMania. Give me a break. But it was a newsworthy show, not because uh, any of the matches threw us a curveball uh, in terms of the outcomes or the winners that we were expecting. It was actually a very predictable show. The two favorites coming in for both Elimination Chamber matches were Drew McIntyre and Becky Lynch. Drew McIntyre and Becky Lynch were the two people who walked out of the show winning the Elimination Chamber. They are going on to WrestleMania to wrestle for gold. Uh, now look, that's something that's going to happen more often than not this time of year. You got to understand something. I I like it and I appreciate it also when things aren't always so predictable and they can throw us a curveball like, oh man, I didn't see that coming. While at the same time, it doesn't feel like they're swerving us just for the sake of swerving us. I like that. I appreciate that. I don't want to know the outcomes all the time before I even start watching the show. But this time of year, you're going into your biggest show of the year. And WrestleMania, not always, but WrestleMania typically is the place where you want to culminate some of your biggest feuds, some of your biggest programs. You want them to reach their peak, to reach their climax at WrestleMania. In other cases, it might not be so much something that's been going on for the last six, nine months or a year. But you have matches that have been teased, even coming out of the Royal Rumble, maybe. There were matches that were being teased as potential directions for WrestleMania. The last thing you want to do is have a show where you go out there and you try to swerve everybody and you throw a curveball in every other match just to kind of throw people off the scent. And now you're going into WrestleMania and I guarantee you, you would have people complaining about the fact that, oh, they're hot-shotting WrestleMania. They're putting this match together. There's no build. Where's the build? Right? You can't please everybody. So you're going to get people that are going to dislike the fact that so many things on this show were predictable. But to me, it didn't ruin my enjoyment level of the show. I thought it was a fine way to spend three and a half hours. I thought actually overall, it was a pretty good show. I liked Elimination Chamber overall, despite that. Just because things, and I talk about this also, just because something is predictable does not always make it bad. Predictable and bad do not always go hand in hand. Tonight was not one of those nights where just because it was predictable, it was a bad show. I didn't think it was a bad show. But what it did was it set up multiple directions for WrestleMania. And this is one of the things that you want out of your Elimination Chamber show. It's the final stop before WrestleMania, right? You want them, because this is it, right? You got six more weeks of TV, but by the Elimination Chamber, you need them to be setting up some obvious directions for Mania. And they did that tonight uh, while teasing some other ones. So we know now that Drew McIntyre is going to WrestleMania and he is the replacement for CM Punk. He is going to challenge Seth Rollins for the World Heavyweight title. Drew McIntyre has been fantastic. He has leaned into this new character. Uh, he's putting out some of the best work he's done his entire career. I find him more interesting and more entertaining now than I ever have before. And yes, we've already seen him and Seth more than once. And he has failed to win the World Heavyweight title. So this is it. Either he goes to WrestleMania and wins the title, or he doesn't and he moves on. But we are going to get that match again at Mania. I think it's the correct decision. The only question is, do they find a way to work Sami Zayn into the match? Because they're also doing this other little story with Sami where he believes in himself. 
he believes he can be champion. And for a while there, he was talking about, I can be a world champion, right? And the last promo he did on TV, if you'll notice, he wasn't talking about being a world champion. He was talking about doing something historic and becoming champion, which is why I think we may be heading for Sammy and Gunther at WrestleMania. So I don't know if they're going to find a way to work him in there. Because he's had his issues with Drew McIntyre as well. He's never beaten Drew. They would have to come up with some way to work him into that match. Uh, but the fact that Sammy went on TV on Monday and flat out said that he was pushing the pause button on his feud with Drew McIntyre, I think means he's going in a different direction. So McIntyre-Rollins is set. Becky Lynch wins the chamber. Rhea Ripley still the women's world champion. We now know that that will be a match at WrestleMania, and that is going to be a big match. That's the biggest possible match they could do uh, right now for that women's world title. Coming out of the men's elimination chamber match, one direction that seems clear now is not LA Knight and Logan Paul. It's Randy Orton and Logan Paul, because Randy Orton lost in the elimination chamber specifically because Logan Paul punched him in the face with brass knucks. And so there you go. Think back to last year. Right? Wasn't it last year's chamber match where they set things up with Seth Rollins and Logan Paul for their WrestleMania match? Well, now things are set up for Logan Paul and Randy Orton. And so where does that leave LA Knight? AJ Styles showed up as a surprise on this show. He got into the chamber and he attacked LA Knight with a steel chair. He cost LA Knight a potential win inside the chamber. That match now, seemingly that is the direction for WrestleMania, not for TV. Now, there is always the possibility that they could work all these guys into one big match for the U.S. title. You know, they could work them into a match and do a four-way. They could work them into a match and expand it and have six guys and do a ladder match and a big clusterfuck. I like the idea of doing Randy Orton and Logan Paul. I just think it would be a very good match. Uh, but I wish they would have gone with L.A. Knight because I think L.A. Knight and Logan Paul, as far as the build, as far as the promo work between them going into Mania, uh, would have been a lot of fun, but let's see what they do on Friday, because there's still a chance, I think, that they may end up putting them all together in some way. The other direction that was teased, and WrestleMania was not mentioned specifically for this, but the other big news coming out of the show has to do with Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins were in a talk show segment on this show. There was no Rock. There was no Roman Reigns. They did not make the long flight, but Cody did flat out say that he wants the Rock. He wants The Rock one-on-one. -on -one. He says, anytime, anywhere. Now, Elimination Chamber is over. There's no other PLEs until WrestleMania. So obviously he's talking WrestleMania. He didn't have to say it. You know exactly what he's talking about. Rock against Cody, one-on-one -on, -one on night one, is an interesting direction for them to tease. I don't think that's what's going to happen. I still think we end up getting the tag team. I think it's going to be Rock and Roman against Cody and Seth on night one. But right now, they want you to think that it's going to be Cody and Rock. Rock is going to be on SmackDown this Friday. We will get more clarity at that point as to whether he accepts or what direction they're going to be going in. So that, that kind of throws a little bit of a monkey wrench into things because uh, that was not one of the more talked about directions, uh, not as much as the tag match. But I, I still feel like that tag match is where we're going to be headed. We'll talk about all that. You know, there was plenty of Aussie representation on the show tonight. Rhea Ripley was in the main event. We had uh, Grayson Waller had his talk show. Indy Hartwell was wrestling on the kickoff for the women's tag team titles. Uh, there was no Bronson Reed, though. Bronson Reed was the one name conspicuous by his absence. This was Bronson Reed on Wednesday. My people. Yes. My wife is pregnant. No, that is not the reason I'm not on WWE Elimination Chamber. Thank you for your concern. Sometimes the stars just don't align. This was Bronson Reed this morning. Full disclosure. Originally, I was set to be at the Elimination Chamber. It would have been an incredible moment. Unfortunately, plans changed, but everything happens for a reason. My wife and I have had our baby early. I was supposed to miss the PLE to make sure that I am here for my family. Okay, <laughs> conflicting messages there. If he was going to be home for his family, 
And I guess that was the reason why, after all, despite what he said back on Wednesday. But congratulations to Bronson Reed. Obviously, that's more important than him being eliminated from uh, the chamber or being pinned by Seth Rollins or whatever he was going to do originally. So uh, congrats to him and the uh, happy couple. But this is your Elimination Chamber review for 2024. As I mentioned, I am the Solo Monster here on a uh, Saturday afternoon. Not our normal time for streaming, but this was not a normal time for a pay-per-view either. Uh, hit that subscribe button. 500 likes is the goal for Be The Booker. So I know we are well on our way to that. Oh, it should be The Rock in there with Roman Reigns. Oh, you Cody fans, you ruined it. You ruined it. Deal with it. Hey, it's Bobbert Reviews breaking in the brand new $45 Super Chat. I think those glasses look good on me. What do you think? Hey, Bobbert, thank you, man. Thank you for the 45 And I got to give a shout out to Boots as well, because Boots dropped a hundy bomb on me before I went live. So shout out to Boots as well. Bronson lied. That's right. He's a liar. Can't trust anything that man says. As you can tell, Super Chats are open, so uh, by all means, if you want to get them on in, I will be reading them afterwards, I promise. I will be going through them, but uh, make sure you hit that like button as well. Now, we have a big uh, stadium show coming up in Philadelphia in April, but they were in Optus Stadium here for Elimination Chamber, which, and I've never been to Australia before, let alone Optus Stadium, but it looked nice. It looked very uh, filled in there. You know what I thought was really cool? And I think this was after the opening match on the main card. Uh, during the tag team title match, the men's tag team title match, they had the sunset. And I just thought they had this shot at one point. You could see the sunset in the background. I just thought, man, that's beautiful. Like, this is a beautiful shot. So it was nice to uh, have a loud crowd, which they were all night long for this show in Australia. I mean, look, they, they're starved for a major show like this. I know they had a show there. Super Showdown or whatever it was, was it five years ago now? But as far as like a proper pay-per-view, they've never had one. They've never had an Elimination Chamber or a Royal Rumble or a SummerSlam. So for them, it was a big deal to get a show like this. So you had 50,000 people there who were making noise all night. That always makes for a more enjoyable show. But there was one kickoff match. We had Indy Hartwell getting the chance to wrestle in front of her fellow countrymen. Tagging with Candice LeRae to take on the Kabuki Warriors, Asuka and Kairi Sane for the women's tag team titles. Superstar reaction here for Indy Hartwell. Easily the biggest reaction she's ever gotten in her entire life. She started out with Kairi, and then when Candice got tagged in, she ended up isolated and the fans chanted, We want Indy. They teased the hot tag spot a couple of times, and then finally the third time she got it, Indy ran wild. Late in the match, Hartwell tagged in Candice and held her arm steady as she was walking the top rope until Kyrie tripped her up. And Hartwell ended up outside with her, and Indy ended up getting run directly into the ring post. So that took care of her. In the ring, the Kabukis finished off Candice with an assisted insane elbow. Asuka held her. Kyrie came off the top rope. And that was all she wrote for Candice and Indy. So I thought it was a nice little basic match to get Indy on the show. That's why they did it. Uh, got Indy a spot on the show. Asuka and Kyrie though, they're wrestling Bailey and Dakota Kai on SmackDown next week. Whether they announced that match or not, I was not expecting a title change here, but especially last night when they announced the plans for SmackDown next week, I said they're not losing the titles here. No way are they losing the titles here. Not going to happen. And by the way, with that tag match on Friday coming up, Bailey better have eyes in the back of her head. I don't trust Dakota Kai. Neither should she. After the match, Indy helped Candice to her feet, and the fans cheered and chanted for Indy. I don't know if she will have a bigger moment than that for the rest of the year. So I hope she enjoyed it. Now the main card opened with our first of two Elimination Chamber matches. They've done this now multiple times over the years, where they open the show with a women's Elimination Chamber Find out who would face Rhea Ripley or Nia Jax. You knew it was going to be Rhea Ripley. At WrestleMania for the women's world title. We had Becky Lynch, Bianca Belair, Naomi, Liv Morgan, Raquel Rodriguez, and Tiffany Stratton. Becky and Naomi kicked things off. 
They exchanged some near falls. Then on the outer platform outside the ring, Becky kicked Naomi into one of the pods. She tried to throw Naomi into the chains. Naomi latched onto the mesh and grabbed Becky with her legs and repeatedly slammed her head first into it. Tiffany Stratton entered next. Yes, I see. I see all the messages here. Tiffy time. We have a lot of Tiffany Stratton fans here. Well deserved. I'm a Tiffany Stratton fan. I've been a Tiffany Stratton fan now for a while. I remember when she first debuted in NXT and how green and inexperienced she was. And seemingly in a pretty short period of time, she got pretty good, and then she got better, and then she got really good. And now she's on the main roster where she belongs. This is a move that has been uh, long overdue, I think. Her and Braun Breaker both. But she entered her very first Elimination Chamber match. She tried to cover both women. Covered one, got an earfall. Covered the other one, got an earfall. Becky attempted to cut off Tiffany. Stratton, though, countered with a spine buster. Becky tried to disarm her. Naomi, though, came flying in with a double crossbody. Becky hit an exploder on Naomi. And then Tiffany managed to lift up both women onto her shoulders. And then uh, Naomi was able to escape. Liv Morgan was in next. Watch me. Right? Is that her theme music? Watch me. Watch me lose this Elimination Chamber match. She immediately went after Tiffany Stratton. This would be a recurring theme here in this match. Nobody likes Tiffany Stratton. They all find her insanely annoying. And so they would make her a target right off the bat. Which, in a way, was a great way of putting her over. Because it's putting the focus on her, right? She's the new one in there. And so they all hated Tiffany. Liv went after Naomi and Becky. Hit a code breaker on her for a near fall. Becky took Stratton, hit an exploder into the cage. And then tried to lock on the disarm her, but Stratton got out. Naomi gave us our first big spot of the night. Big blockbuster off the top of one of the pods to live. But Tiffany swoops in and rolls up deep. Rolls up Naomi and pins her. So Naomi is the first one eliminated here in this chamber match. Raquel Rodriguez was the next one in. And I gotta say this, you know, I talked about Raquel's comeback on Raw Monday in the Battle Royal when she won. Because a lot of people thought, like, I didn't know she was injured. and. She wasn't injured. Uh, she's been out with this uh, this illness that it's a weird thing. I don't know how common it is. But basically, her, her body reacts as if uh, she's been exposed to something that would trigger an allergic reaction. But she's not actually around anything that would trigger an allergic reaction. It's almost like her body is attacking itself. And so she ends up with these, uh, these red blotches and hives, and her eyes will swell. It's an awful thing, and they've been trying to figure out exactly how to combat this, and they still haven't figured it out. Even though she's back, you know, she's posted on social media, she's been very open about this. So it was very noticeable when she walked out, uh, she didn't have any makeup on her face, and her eyes were very puffy. So clearly she was having an attack, or she was still experiencing symptoms, but she went out there, and I, I did think that she was... Rusty is not the word for it, but she was a little off. In this match and it could have had to do with that again i don't know how she was feeling you could tell there was some swelling around her eyes that may have affected her performance here but uh she went out there and again she also went after tiffany like i said everybody was pretty much going after tiffany she dominated for a while until becky clipped raquel's knee everybody piled on top of her to try to pin her but she powered out of it not that that spot doesn't look contrived every time somebody does it, you know, male or female. But in this case, it looked overly contrived. And that's why the fans started chanting bullshit. Because you could hear it. You could hear it after she powered out and everybody went flying. You could hear the bullshit chants. Bianca Belair was the final entrant in the match. And I'll give you one guess who Bianca went after as soon as she got into the ring. Tiffany Shrek. She actually threw her into the pod, her pod, and shut the door behind her. Belair hit a delayed vertical suplex on Becky and then took out Tiffany with a spine buster. Bianca and Raquel went face to face. They ended up outside the ring where Rodriguez went for a vertical suplex. Bianca springboarded off, hit this great DDT. Tiffany and Becky, 
they ended up on top of one of the pods. And Tiffany threw her off. So down goes Becky. And she's outside the ring, and she's all clustered together with the other people in the match. And this was Tiffany's big uh, highlight reel moment. I thought she was going to go for the moonsault. She did not go for the moonsault, but she did do a swanton bomb off the top of the pod and wiped everybody out. Exactly what she did when she got into the Royal Rumble. She was in the Women's Royal Rumble this year. First thing she did, went to the top row, wiped everybody out. So she did it again here. And that was your second big spot of the match. Stratton and Morgan, they fought in the ring. Tiffany hit a rolling senton and then went to the ropes to set up for the prettiest moonsault ever. Morgan got up, though, and cut her off and then hit Oblivion to pin Tiffany Stratton. And oh my, these people did not like that at all. These people chanted bullshit for that elimination. They did not like Tiffany being eliminated by Liv. This was a breakout performance in this match for Tiffany Stratton. Uh, she's super athletic, and she can do some very impressive things. I mean, so is Bianca Belair. One of the reasons why I want to see the two of them have a WrestleMania match this year. I just think it makes sense because Bianca doesn't have any obvious direction, neither does Tiffany. So she's super athletic and she can do some very uh, impressive stuff. But most of the time, and including in this match, where she could have kind of hung back and let them kind of go after each other, she doesn't really play the chicken shit heel. You know, we kind of saw that when she had that Extreme Rules match with Becky Lynch last year in No Mercy. Uh, you know, she's got a mean streak in her, and she'll take it to you. Yeah, I mean, she's a heel, but not really like a chicken shit heel. But the people uh, clearly liked her and were not happy when she was eliminated. Becky, in the ring, got Raquel in an arm bar. Raquel, though, lifted her up for the Tejana bomb. And then when Liv hit the ropes to try for Oblivion, Raquel grabbed her, too, and gave them both a double Tejana bomb. At least Corey Graves called it by its name. Uh, Michael Cole didn't seem to know what the name of the move was. Didn't seem to know this woman's finish. Bianca came over, though, and lifted Raquel up for the KOD and hit it and pinned her. And so now we were down to three. Becky Lynch, Bianca Belair, and Liv Morgan. And what I liked about that is these were the only real choices in this match. Naomi was not winning. Tiffany Stratton was not winning. Raquel Rodriguez was not winning. It came down to the three people you could plausibly say any of these three women could have won. In fact, I would have ranked them Becky, Bianca, and Liv in that order of uh, predictability. Liv, because of her history with Rhea, and Bianca, just because her and Rhea one day, maybe at WrestleMania 41, uh, is going to be a fucking great match. So these are your final three. Bianca threw Liv into the chain wall. Becky hit a... A simultaneous Scorpion death drop and a DDT on the padded floor outside the ring. Morgan superplexed Becky. Bianca hit a 450 splash from the opposite corner, but Becky got her knees up. And Bianca ducked Morgan's step up in Zaguri and went for the KOD. Liv countered into a jawbreaker. Liv then hit Becky with a codebreaker. Bianca went for the KOD. Becky slipped out. And then Liv Morgan snuck up from behind Bianca, and she rolled up Bianca Belair and pinned her. A bit of a shock elimination there to dispose of Bianca Belair, but then as soon as Liv got back to her feet, Becky caught her with a manhandle slam and pinned her. It was that quick. The roll-up happened, one, two, three, she gets up, manhandle slam, one, two, three, match over. That was the finishing sequence. The chamber over, right around the 30-minute mark. Maybe 31, 32, somewhere in that range. Uh, Becky Lynch punches her ticket to the women's world title match at WrestleMania. Uh, Becky was the favorite coming in, and for good reason. Uh, you could have made an argument for Liv Morgan for the reasons I mentioned, because she's on her revenge tour. Why is she on her revenge tour? Because Rhea Ripley injured her in storyline. So she should want to come back and get revenge. But that's not the match to do at WrestleMania. If they wanted to, they could have done it here on the Chamber Show. But, you know, I know why they didn't want to do that, because they wanted they wanted Rhea in there with somebody who was no doubt going to get booed and allow Rhea to get fully cheered. And I think if you would have put Liv Morgan in there, she would have been booed and Rhea would have been fully cheered. But I know why they did it that way. Uh, but that's not the match to do. 
the match to do because they've been teasing it and because it's the biggest possible match they could do for that belt at WrestleMania is Rhea Ripley against Becky Lynch. It was the correct choice. I thought it was a very good chamber match. Uh, I thought maybe uh, the best one yet with the women possibly was. I was thinking back to some of the more recent ones and there's no one women's chamber match that they've done in the last five or six years that really stands out to me as being head and shoulders above the rest. So I think this one, this one probably wins by default. Uh, but again, it was a breakout night for Tiffany Stratton, not even scratching the surface yet of what she's going to do on that main roster. Uh, now let's get her in the ring with Bianca. I think that's the match you do at WrestleMania 40. Uh, but Tiffany, Tiffany is uh, definitely going to go down as the star of this match here especially with the fans. We had Finn Balor and Damian Priest defending the undisputed tag team titles against Pete Dunne and Tyler Bate. Our truth was not on the show. And Michael Cole told all of us, I don't know if you saw it on social media, the reason our truth was not there is because poor our truth, he thought that the show was in Austria. He thought the show was in Austria. He flew himself to Austria. And imagine his surprise when he got there and didn't see anybody there. So that's why he was not on the show. Dominic Mysterio introduced the champs himself. He got a ton of heat for it. Bait and Dunn cleared him out of the ring. They went after the champions, and then the referee called for the bell. A little while later, Dominic hit Bait with a cheap shot from the floor, and Priest distracted the referee so he didn't see it. Priest threw Dunn over the top rope to the floor. Bate made it to his corner, but Pete Dunn was still down, so he had nobody to tag. Bate knocked Priest off the apron. Then he hit Balor with an uppercut. Dunn got back to the corner. He took a hot tag from Bate. He cleared Balor. He cleared Priest from the ring. He went to the middle rope. He hit a moonsault onto both men on the floor. Dunn brought Balor back inside and stomped the fingers. Bate tagged in. He clotheslined Balor into a German suplex by Dunn. Balor came back with a standing stomp. Tagged in Damian Priest, who went for a corner splash. Tyler Bate moved out of the way. Priest recovered, though. He turned Bate inside out with a lariat. Bate came back, and he hit a spinning slam on Balor. Priest ran in. Bate powered him up and performed a long airplane spin. Bate tagged in. Uh, Dunn. And then he took out Priest with a dive to the floor. Dunn hit Balor with the bitter end and had him beat. Dominic, though, reached in. He grabbed the foot, and he placed the foot under the bottom rope to break the count. So the referee didn't see it, but the referee got wind of what happened here. Dom was denying it. Referee ended up ejecting him to a big pop. Uh, at that point, the screen went black for 20 seconds. I'm not sure why. Maybe he mooned the referees. I don't know why they blacked out the screen. We could still hear the audio, though. Balor told Priest that it was time for the razor's edge. He tagged him in. Priest hoisted Bate up. He countered out of it, though. Now, the spot was supposed to be that in maneuvering his way out, he flipped his way out of it, the momentum would send Damian Priest forward, and it would crotch his partner, Balor, who was up on the top rope. Unfortunately, he kind of tripped. Priest got tripped up a little bit, and his momentum stalled. But the spot was he's got to go crashing into the corner, so he threw himself into the corner, and it looked fucking lame. Bait rolled up Priest for a near fall. Dunn tagged in. He joined Bait in throwing some kicks at Priest. Priest grabbed both men by the throat. He went for a double choke slam. They avoided it. They hoisted him up for what they are calling the Birming Hammer. You see, because Pete Dunn is from Birmingham. So it's not the burning hammer, it's the burning hammer. That's what they're calling it. Dunn covered Priest, but he kicked out. So much for the burning hammer. Then they set up Priest for a move from the ropes. Balor, though, stopped them by grabbing their feet. Priest recovered, he hit a double south of heaven choke slam. Balor, who had tagged in, followed that up with the double stomp to Pete Dunn off the top and he covered him to retain the tag team titles. One of the best title defenses yet for the Judgment Day. This was a match that, on paper coming in, I knew was going to be a great match, just given the uh, talent involved. How could it not be? 
right? All four of these guys. How could it not be? It's when Bait and Dunn beat DIY. Did they beat DIY, right? They beat DIY a few weeks ago. I would have been fine with either one of those matches because I knew the titles were not going to change hands. But we were going to get a banger of a match at it. And that's what we got here. These two guys, Pete Dunn and Tyler Bait, or, or uh, yeah, Tyler Bait and Pete Dunn. I thought I mixed their names up. Uh, Birmingham. They went out there and they knew this was a big spotlight on them because they're still a relatively new team here on the main roster. So they had to go out there and show what they can do. And they did. I was not expecting a title change here this close to WrestleMania. Conceivably, could there have been a miscue with the Judgment Day that led to a title change? It could have happened, but it went pretty much exactly the way I expected it to. Um, and now we head to WrestleMania. Now they've beaten DIY. They've beaten Bait and Dunn. The next obvious direction here for WrestleMania is going to be The Miz and R-Truth. That's exactly where they're heading with this. Miz and R-Truth are going to win the tag team titles from the Judgment Day. They're going to give R-Truth this big moment at WrestleMania because he is so beloved by these people. Every single week, everywhere he goes, even the people that may not like his, his comedy or they don't like how he's hamming it up or whatever, can't deny the fact that this guy gets these big reactions every time he goes out there. They love R-Truth. You know, what's not to love? And so now imagine him going to WrestleMania and being the one to get that winning pinfall on Damian Priest, and he wins the titles. How many times has R-Truth been a champion in this company, right? And I'm not counting the 24-7 title, okay? Forget that. That's in the garbage. It was burned. It doesn't exist anymore. Has R-Truth held a title in WWE before? I don't think so. I mean, I know he's a former NWA champion, but... Clearly, that's where this is headed here. This, this whole story with R-Truth and the Judgment Day has to have some sort of payoff to it. And that would be a pretty sweet one. It would be a crowd-pleasing moment at WrestleMania. That's exactly where this is headed. Next up, we had the Grayson Waller effect. Hit the deck, everybody. Hit the deck. Cody's Pyro is here, everyone. That shit is deadly. Absolutely deadly. Was that our friend ABK? I believe it was. ABK with the giant super chat that is not listed on my screen right now. They were pushing out late last night. That's why I almost couldn't put them on the screen. And uh, the, these conversions are... They're pushing out very slowly, but that sounded to me Warning. like a gigantic bomb there from ABK, who says, I'm waiting forever for a response from JM and Aaron. Only Faisal has accepted for a match at WrestleMania 40, so acknowledge me. That's right. He's still waiting on a response. Don't chicken out now. Don't chicken out on him now. Hey, ABK. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. ABK all F and day. That's exactly right. That leads us to the Grayson Waller effect. We interrupt this uh, wrestling program for a talk show. Austin Theory was in the ring and he talked about hating Vegemite and ordering from Outback Steakhouse. Now that'll get you some heat. That will get you some heat. Funny little side story to that. You know what got me some heat? First time I went to New Orleans which was for WrestleMania 10 years ago. I uh, love New Orleans. It was great there. Food was great. First thing I wanted to do when I got to uh, New Orleans, and uh, some of my friends were just completely uh, disgusted by this, I wanted to get Popeyes. What's so bad about that? Apparently, that's like sacrilege. Like, you don't go to New Orleans on vacation and eat Popeyes. You don't do that. So that got him some heat. He then introduced the host of the show, Grayson Waller. He came out to a big ovation. He did a shooey with a UFC fighter in the front row where they each drank beer out of a gold shoe, which sounds fucking disgusting. I don't care whether the shoe was used or not. You know, if this was like 30 years ago, it totally would have been used. Not only would that shoe have been used, one of the one of the boys in the back would have slipped one of their used uh, shoes 
for them to do a shoey in, but they probably would have done some other things in the shoe instead <laughs> of just handing a clean shoe over to the person. See, that's the way it would have been done in the locker room back in the day. But I don't know. I don't know where this ritual started. I have no idea. But uh, I think it's very stupid. So finally, I'm sorry if that's an Australian thing. I think it's very stupid. So finally, he introduced Seth Rollins. And the crowd sang his song even after the song ended. Sang his song. I'm sitting here going. And I didn't even wake up at 5 a.m. at the very beginning to watch this show. But I can imagine somebody who woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning is sitting here. And by this point, it was probably 6 a.m. here on the East Coast. Going, can we please get on with this? Because he just stood there. He stood there with his arms out. He was soaking up the reaction. I get it. I understand it. But you know what? Let's speed things up a little bit. Thank you very much. It's too early in the morning for this. And we still had one more entrance to go. Waller introduced, and I quote, the man who can thank the American education system for his inability to finish a story, Cody Rhodes. I can vouch for that, by the way. I, I can vouch for uh, that based on some of the comments that I get every week. The American education system has failed us. So Cody asked the fans, what do you want to talk about? And Waller felt that uh, they should take a moment to acknowledge Ry Roman Reigns. I, said, I almost said Rhinestone Reigns. Roman Reigns as our tribal chief. And people booed, but you could see plenty of people out in the audience putting their finger up in the air. Waller asked Rollins who he wants to win the men's chamber so that he can go on to defend against them at WrestleMania. And Rollins said the chamber match is stacked, and he wasn't sure. But he said he had a secret. And that secret is that he is only days away from being medically cleared to compete. And he said, whoever wins the chamber match would not stand a chance against him. Waller said that they could have had the biggest match in WrestleMania history with The Rock against Roman Reigns. It was right there. It almost happened. Fans booed. And Waller asked Cody if he feels he was selfish for taking that match away from everybody. Cody said that, look, I'm a fan of Dwayne The Rock Johnson. He said if Rock were here right now, he'd probably call Cody a candy something, and he would talk about pie. And then he asked if uh, there were any Cody crybabies in attendance. And the fans cheered, and he said, look, you know, this pyro has, I don't have such good hearing after all this pyro. Yeah, no shit. ABK could attest to that. I'm not going to have any good hearing either after these uh, Cody bombs. But I don't hear too well. He goes, are there any Cody crybabies in attendance? And everybody cheered. Cody said, one thing The Rock would not want to talk about is the conversation that the two of them had that led to Cody stepping out of the WrestleMania main event in the first place before he stepped back into it. And this was not expanded upon beyond that. I was happy that he at least acknowledged it because it shows me that at some point we might yet get an explanation for why Cody would even step aside in the first place to allow this man to take from him what he worked so hard all year to get back. Still no explanation about that. So they acknowledged it. We may end up getting an explanation, but we still don't know exactly why Cody did what he did. Cody said that, you know, maybe The, the Rock was the people's champion at one time, but he thinks that you actually have to be around the people to call yourself the people's champion. And then Cody said that he had an announcement of his own. And he stood up, and he talked about The Rock smacking him in the face in Las Vegas at the press conference. Cody said, I'm facing Roman Reigns in the main event of WrestleMania 40, but I'm wide open until then. And he said he wants to wrestle The Rock one-on-one, -on -one, anytime, anyplace. Rollins stood up out of his chair, and he put his hand on Cody's shoulder. And Rollins said, it's time to cut the head off the snake once and for all. He said that he admires Cody challenging The Rock, but the world knows that there's no such thing as one-on-one -on -one with the bloodline. Rollins said that if Rock accepts that challenge, just know you will not be fighting alone. I thought for a second there, when Rollins stood up and said, you know, it's time to cut the head off the beast, I thought he was going to issue a challenge to Roman Reigns. 
And I thought for a second there that they were going to do Cody and Rock and Seth against Roman on, on night one. Why don't you just give, give all four of them just both cards? They can have various permutations of the same match over and over on the entire card. You don't even need anybody else. You can just put them on night one, have them wrestle, have them put them on night two, let them take up the card that night too. There you go. I'm sure that the other people on the roster are like, come on. Is this really necessary? You know, we're here too, you know. But I thought maybe that's where they were headed with this. And uh, thankfully, I, I don't think that's the case because I'm not really a fan of that idea. Waller boasted about getting another scoop on his show. He was so excited. But then Theory took the mic away from him. Theory asked Cody if he thought that he was actually going to face The Rock before pulling the whole, it doesn't matter what you think. Pulled that on Cody. Rollins laughed and said, eh, it was pretty good. And Theory said, well, I got more. He said, finally, Austin Theory has come to Perth, Australia, to finish his story. Rollins encouraged him to do more. Theory took his jacket off, and he got ready for it. And he started, he said, if you smell, but before he could finish the line, Rollins grabbed him, and he sent him uh, into the Grayson Waller show, or Grayson Waller effect sign that was in the corner. And then Cody hit Theory with a Cody cutter in his suit. Rollins followed that with a stomp on Theory. Waller just stood back. He took a few steps back and leaned up against the ropes when they started beating up his boy, and he just watched the entire thing. Did not even lift a finger to help his partner. And then they and never took a bump. They played Seth's music, then they played Cody's music, and that is how they closed out the segment. So here's why they did the segment. They did the segment because it was a way to get Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins on the show. They had been bitten hard by the injury bug. CM Punk was going to win the Elimination Chamber on this show. CM Punk was not even on the show. Seth Rollins got hurt. He couldn't wrestle. So they were not going to have the Elimination Chamber, not have Rock, not have Roman, not have Punk, and then leave Cody and Seth out of the equation. So it was a way to get them on the show. Obviously, the fans were very happy to see them. They were doing the woe, and they were chanting along with Seth's music. So that's why they were on the program. But even with Cody challenging The Rock and Seth announcing that he's, you know, days away from being medically cleared, which we already knew he was on his way back soon anyway, um, this was not really a very newsworthy segment otherwise. I mean, it was just... Even the way it ended, it was just like, that's it? It's pretty underwhelming overall here. No bloodline. No Rock or Roman, which was a stretch. I wasn't, you know, surprised not to see them. I was I was thinking maybe there'd be a surprise appearance. Uh, but there was no Rock, there was no Roman, there was no Jimmy, there was no Solo. There was no bloodline at all. And the reason I bring that up is because we had a segment on SmackDown last night for the people who watched SmackDown. I know a lot of you probably did not. Uh, you didn't miss much. But they had a backstage segment with Roman Reigns and Grayson Waller. He called Grayson Waller into the locker room. And he told him, this is for your ears only. I got something to tell you. And they cut away. So we don't know what he told him. Apparently, he told him nothing. Apparently, he just kind of leaned in and said, what's your name again? Or what's the weather going to be like tomorrow? I don't know what he told him. There was no follow-up whatsoever. There was, there was nothing that came out of this supposed conversation that Roman Reigns had with Grayson Waller. It was simply something they did to try to give you a little bit of a hook to want to tune in and see the segment, but there was no follow-up on that whatsoever. So Cody challenges Rock to a singles match. Uh, I am still of the mindset that we're not getting a singles match between Cody and The Rock. I still think the plan is going to be a tag team match. I think it's going to be Cody and Seth against Rock and Roman on night one. And that way, Rock gets to wrestle, because I, I do believe that he was planning on wrestling. Obviously, things got shaken up, but he wants to get in the ring and work. He wants to work a match. Well, he can work a tag team match. That way, it's not all on him. We know we're going to get Rock and Roman at some point, probably next year. But this way, he gets to be involved. It doesn't have to be in a straight singles match. Uh, we're seeing Cody and Seth walk around attached at the hip like they're Siamese twins. How could it not be leading to a tag team situation? Now, Rock is going to be on SmackDown this Friday. They announced that last night. We'll find out then. I think we should uh, get our answer on that show. 
Uh, but I'm still in the camp of we're going to end up with a tag match, not a rock singles match against Cody. Now, next up was the men's Elimination Chamber match to find out who challenges Seth Rollins for the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania. And we had Drew McIntyre, Randy Orton, L.A. Knight, Kevin Owens, Bobby Lashley, and Logan Paul. McIntyre and Knight kicked things off. The fans chanted CM Punk at Drew, and he taunted CM Punk. He even uh, tried for an early go to sleep, but Knight slipped out of it. He slammed Drew's head repeatedly into the glass on Logan Paul's pod while he watched on. Then he did the same by KO's pod, and Owens applauded as he watched from inside the pod. Owens was in next. He delivered a choke slam to LA Knight, and Michael Cole told us that uh, Owens had just met with a Make a Wish child the night before. And he had promised this child that he would do a choke slam at some point during his match, which was very nice. And so he busted out actually a pretty good choke slam, too. But he didn't win with it. It was not good enough to get an elimination. But he hit the choke slam. So he started pounding on Logan Paul's pod, desperately trying to get at this man in the worst way. Owens and Knight then worked together. They tried to superplex on Drew. He fought them off and then wiped them out with a crossbody off the ropes. It based Beerus, thank you. Thank you for the nine bucks. Be very holy. Be holier than thou, God of Seduction. I appreciate it. So that led to Bobby Lashley entering next at number four. Bobby was out there. His arm was wrapped. It was in a brace. Again, if you did not see SmackDown, Karrion Cross took a steel chair to Bobby's elbow on the show last night. So he was out there with it all wrapped up. Lashley was dominant until McIntyre cut him off with a Glasgow kiss. McIntyre then went up top. He jumped over a charging Lashley, who then hit him with a spine buster and covered him for a two count. The fifth entrant into this elimination chamber match was Randy Orton. Big pop for Orton, entering his ninth elimination chamber. That is an all-time record. That breaks the tie that he had with Chris Jericho. And they actually acknowledged him. They acknowledged Jericho on commentary when Michael Cole mentioned that fact. Orton hit a power slam on Owens, and then he went for a draping DDT that Owens avoided, but he ended up hitting the move on the outside of the ring. Uh, but Orton winced after the move, and the announcers pointed out they really played up the idea that, oh, he's seriously hurt. Randy's hurt. I can't believe, by the way, before I even came live, how many messages I saw asking if Randy Orton is okay, wondering how badly he was hurt. It just goes to show you how great he is at what he does. Randy Orton was not injured in this match, not any more than anybody else was probably banged up in the chamber, uh, although they have a lot more padding in the chamber now. The original chamber, when they had the, uh, like the steel grates outside the ring and everything, man, that thing was very unforgiving. And uh, a few years ago, I think it was actually back in uh, 2017, I want to say it was the chamber where Bray Wyatt uh, won the WWE title, which was a great match. Bray was in there, AJ Styles was in there, Cena was in there. I think that was the first time uh, that they really updated the chamber and they put the padding outside. And I remember so many people complained about that. And it's like, dude, like these guys are getting fucking wrecked in this thing. <laughs> if they want to lay some padding down on the outside, I got no problem with that. The hell are you bitching about? So it's been a while since we've had that uh, that new chamber, but Orton was just selling. He was doing a very good job of selling the back. Everybody knows he missed 18 months because of a broken back. Shawn Michaels did the same thing when he first came back in 2002. He would clutch his back, right? People would focus on the back, not because he still had a broken back, but because he missed four years of his career because of a broken back. And it only made sense for him to sell the back. So Orton is fine. Orton is fine. Don't worry about Randy. He's fine. So we had LA Knight dropping McIntyre with a DDT on the outside of the ring. Orton got back to his feet, hit a suplex on Knight. And Orton immediately went back to clutching the back. The sixth and final entrant here in this chamber match was Logan Paul. Logan Paul was breathing into the glass 
and drawing things with his finger. And he wrote, with his finger, Kevin sucks. And that did not really impress Kevin Owens very much. So as soon as Logan Paul's pod opened, uh, he was trying desperately to keep it closed because Owens was trying to get at him, and eventually he did. He got inside, he was working him over. Owens pulled Logan out of the pod and then uh, ran him into another one. Owens tossed Logan over the top rope and inside the ring, then clotheslined him right back out over the top rope. Logan was throwing uppercuts at Owens, and then he blasted him. He blasted Logan with this lariat, this hard clothesline. Lashley grabbed KO. He threw him uh, through the glass of one of the pods. And then Lashley turned, and he saw Logan Paul standing there in front of the opposite pod. And, of course, couldn't help himself, so he came charging in, and he speared Logan Paul through the pod on the opposite side. Both men crashed through the glass. The fans chanted, thank you, Bobby. He stood up. He was favoring the bad arm. He said some naughty words, because I know he did, because they muted the audio. I heard a fuck. It was a fuck that got through. But they muted the audio for about five seconds. When Lashley turned around, though, he walked right into a Claymore kick by McIntyre. Back in the ring, it was night, and Lashley and McIntyre came flying in with another Claymore kick to Bobby before he could put the hurt lock on L.A. Knight. And that was the end of Bobby Lashley. Drew McIntyre disposes of him. Now that I think about it, I think Randy Orton and uh, Drew McIntyre, if I'm not mistaken, I believe were the only people responsible for all the eliminations in this match. I believe so. So that took care of Bobby, and that's precisely why they did the injury angle last night on SmackDown. They wanted to give him an out when he was eliminated, because he wasn't winning the chamber. They could point to the fact that he went in there at less than 100%. So there you go. It's right, it's right there in front of your face. Should have been obvious after last night's show. JM says there was a fuck and a shit that got through. Well, then what the hell did they mute the audio for? <laughs> You would think those would be the two worst offenders right there. So what, what did they actually mute? They probably muted, like, the one non-curse word that he said. I would love to, like, sit next to one of these people in the truck one day who, who are responsible for doing it. Because I know these shows are on a seven-second delay, I believe. And we've seen this in AEW also on the television shows, where a guy will come out there and will drop an F-bomb. And then he'll get censored. Completely miss it. Then he'll curse again, and then they'll mute him, but they miss it again. Like, how do these people get up in the morning and wipe their ass? Like, is it really that hard? Maybe it is. I'd love to sit there and watch them and see how, like, when they're in action on a live show, when they have to, like, they got that, have their finger on the button there. Apparently, it's a much more difficult job than I expected. I don't know. I don't get it. I don't know why they're muting on Peacock anyway, by the way. I pay good money to not get the curse words muted out. I don't like that. They need to they need to not do that. So officials spilled into the cage to get Lashley out. That meant the door was open. Nothing good ever happens when the door of the chamber is open. Knight dropped Orton with a BFT and then dropped McIntyre with one as well. He went to go pin Drew when AJ Styles showed up with a steel chair. He blasted L.A. Knight across the back with the chair. You leave the door open, you never know who's going to show up. Knight played a role in uh, A.J.'s loss, if you remember, to Drew McIntyre in his qualifying match. He was the reason why A.J. didn't go to the chamber. Ergo, he's the reason why A.J. is not potentially wrestling Seth Rollins for the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania. The only surprising thing about it is that they didn't do the screw job on Raw the following week when LA Knight had his uh, qualifying match. I said, that's kind of odd that AJ wouldn't come out to cost him because he cost AJ his match. AJ Styles must have, in his mind, he was trusting the fact that at some point during this, I mean, think about the logic of this. When you really break it down and think how goofy the logic is here, the only reason AJ got into the cage is because the door was open so they could get Bobby Lashley out because he was hurt, right? Well, how did AJ know that they were going to open the door to help Bobby Lashley out? He waited this entire time. He allowed LA Knight to actually go to the elimination chamber. 
and be this close to a world championship match at WrestleMania. Banking on the fact that the door would be open and he would be able to get inside and do what he did. It's putting an awful lot of trust in the process here. But it paid off for him, and LA Knight ends up being eliminated here. Styles hit him repeatedly with the chair and then delivered a Styles clash on top of the chair. McIntyre then crawled on top of Knight. He pinned him, so that was the end of him. Now it was down to the final four. Drew McIntyre, Randy Orton, Kevin Owens, and Logan Paul. Owens hit a cannonball in the corner to McIntyre. Then he hit a swan top. Oh, that, that's right, the flight. That's right. That's a great point. AJ was playing the long game. AJ was playing the dumb game. That's the point I'm trying to make. He was playing the dumb game. My God, he flew almost 24 hours around the world, hoping that door would be open during the match. You know, hey, sometimes people are gamblers, and they're willing to take a chance, I guess. That's how angry AJ Styles is. But we had the uh, we had Owens go for a swanton bomb to Orton for a near fall. He tried for a swanton to Drew. Drew got the knees up though, and that made for a rough looking landing. It's the amazing Goon. Oh, it's our buddy Gunthar. Jerry Lawler loves Gunthar, the magnificent. All hail it's Goon our buddy. Thar. It's our buddy Gunthar M Mills. Dropping a $50 super chat. No message, just dropping some love. M. Mills, thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. And I hope you are having a great Saturday afternoon. It's a little weird being with you here at 2 o'clock on a Saturday, but I don't think anybody's complaining, right? No, Nobody's complaining about this. Except me having to wake up at 6.30 to watch this pay-per-view. So there was a Claymore attempt. Uh, by Drew that got countered into a pop-up powerbomb. Logan then tried to attack Owens. Owens, though, kicked him in the gut, dropped him with a stunner. Orton tried for an RKO to Owens, but he avoided it. Tried for a pop-up powerbomb. Orton avoided that, and he did end up hitting the RKO, and he pinned Kevin Owens. And now we were down to three. Drew McIntyre, Randy Orton, and Logan Paul. McIntyre and Orton, who was still clutching his back, they came nose to nose. They started exchanging strikes. Snap power slam by Orton. Orton crotched Logan on the top rope. McIntyre came back over. He stuffed an RKO attempt, and Drew dropped him with a neck breaker. So McIntyre kicks up to his feet, and then Logan Paul wipes him out with a crossbody block off the top of one of the pots. And that was the craziest thing that he did in the entire match which is a lot more tame than what I was expecting. Logan was the first one up. He pulled, he reached into his uh, pants, and I don't know if he was fondling himself or what, but he, he pulled out the brass knuckles, and I was relieved that that's all he was doing. So he takes the brass knucks out, and he's got them on his fist, and they're, of course, legal inside the chamber because there's no disqualification. So he doesn't need his friend Jeff to reach over the barricade to hand him the knucks. And instead of going and using them, he decides to stand there and smile and pose and pump his fist in the air. And that was very stupid because that allowed Randy Orton to swoop in from out of nowhere and deliver an RKO. And then Randy Orton pinned Logan Paul. And now we're down to the final two. Drew McIntyre and Randy Orton. And like the women's match, it comes down to the two men who were most favored to win this chamber match, which that makes it a little more unpredictable. Like, even if you had it in your head that Drew's going to win coming in, but if it's not Drew, it's going to be Randy. Well, it came down to Drew and Randy. So in that way, they tried to take the unpredictable approach. If it came down to Drew and Owens, or Drew and Bobby, you know what I mean? Like, there would have been no question who was going over in this match. So that I liked. Randy Orton and Drew McIntyre. Orton nailed the draping DDT, and he was feeling it. He was, he was getting those feelings, and the crowd was pumping him up. He was feeling pain, too. Pain is what he was feeling from his lower back. But he was getting in that zone. He set up for the RKO. McIntyre shoved him off, though, and dropped him with a spine buster. 
McIntyre counted down for the Claymore kick as Orton was starting to stir and get back up. But then Randy collapsed down to the mat in pain right before Drew was about to launch forward with the kick. So now Drew is standing there. He's got this very blank stare on his face. And he's looking down at Randy and he starts to slowly walk over. Now he gets a smile on his face. And Orton is starting to slowly get back up to his feet. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, Orton shoots up and he drops Drew McIntyre with an RKO out of nowhere. Now watching on TV, the way they shot this, we couldn't see that Logan Paul was still inside the chamber. If you're in the stadium, you could see it. We couldn't see that Logan was still inside, so my mind had already gone away from Logan Paul and I was focused on these two. But there he was, and Logan Paul then comes from out of nowhere. And with a right hand loaded with the knucks, punches Orton right in the face and knocks out Randy Orton. McIntyre slowly makes his way on top of Orton for the cover, and he pins Randy Orton to win the Elimination Chamber at nearly the 40-minute mark. Came pretty close to 40 minutes here. And he punches his ticket to WrestleMania one more time to challenge for the World Heavyweight Championship. I thought this was another strong chamber match. This was not at the level of the U.S. title one from last year's show, which I thought was one of the best chamber matches in years. This was not quite at that level. Uh, but like the women's, I thought it was, uh, it was a good chamber match. I like the women's more. I actually think the women had the stronger of the two chamber matches. This one was more story-driven. Nothing too crazy. Uh, nothing as far as spots go. I mean, nothing really out of the ordinary that you would have to go back and rewatch. But again, a lot heavier on the story. And surprisingly, the women actually had more uh, kind of highlight reel moments, I guess you would say. And even there, there weren't that many of them. But sometimes they, they like to go crazy. Like, what can we do that hasn't been done before? Some kind of crazy fall or dive or something. Uh, the women actually had more spots like that in their match than the men's did. That in and of itself does not make it a better match. I'm not so much interested in spots. But I did think the women's match was slightly better than the men's. I put it ahead by maybe, I don't know, maybe maybe half a star. So it wasn't that much better, but it, I thought it was better than the men's match. But I thought they were both very good. And it also did something that I like to see in these Elimination Chamber matches. It set up multiple uh, potential directions for WrestleMania. Obviously, we know McIntyre is wrestling Seth Rollins. Sami Zayn being added or not, probably not. There's always the possibility, yes, that could happen, but right now it's one-on-one, -on -one, and I think that's the right match. Logan Paul and Randy Orton just set up their issue on the show for the United States title of WrestleMania. AJ Styles cost LA Knight the chance to go to WrestleMania to wrestle for the world title. Those two are going to have to battle it out. The only question that's left, do they keep it that way and do them as separate singles matches? Or do we end up getting some kind of a multi-man match at WrestleMania for the U.S. title? We've had ladder matches for the Intercontinental title in the past. Do they do a ladder match where everybody hates Logan Paul? Everybody wants to take the U.S. title away from Logan Paul and we get Logan and Randy and Knight and Styles and... Throw Owens in there. You put Lashley in there if they want to. You could do that. You could do some kind of six or eight man clusterfuck for the U.S. title. I like the idea of Randy Orton and, and Logan Paul one on one. I wish it was L.A. Knight and Logan Paul one on one, but I can't hate on Randy Orton and Logan Paul because I think that's also going to be a, a great match if they go in that direction. That's what I would do. But I could easily see them working it into a multi-man match because Kevin Owens now is kind of the odd man out. At least Bobby Lashley, I could see them in God help us if they drag this thing out for too long. But they're doing this final testament thing with the Street Profits and Bobby Lashley. I could see a match with all six of those guys or a singles match with Lashley and Cross at WrestleMania. You know, I'd like to see them come up with something a little bit better for Bobby Lashley. But he could easily be accounted for. Kevin Owens is not accounted for. Like, what does he do on the show? You stick him in there with Braun Breaker, who might be a babyface, so that doesn't really work. I, I don't know. 
Uh, they could do Kevin Owens and Logan Paul on TV between now and WrestleMania and get that rematch out of the way. Because there's going to be a rematch with them at some point. They could do that on TV and then Logan can move on to, to Randy Orton. Uh, but because Owens has no obvious direction, it makes me think we're going to get a multi-man match at WrestleMania for that title. Now, after some video packages, they came back to Triple H, the CCO. The CCO, the Chief Content Officer. How many titles has he had? Wasn't he the, uh, what was his previous title? He was the, um, he wasn't the C. I was going to say he's the CFO. But <laughs> Whatever you do, don't take, a, don't take an ex-wrestler and put him in charge of the numbers. That's not going to end well. But he, anyway, he's the, uh, the CCO. And he's already in the ring. They're playing his music. Thankfully, we didn't have to watch him get a full entrance down to the ring. And he was there to announce the official attendance, which was 52,590. That was the quoted attendance for Elimination Chamber. I don't know if they hit 52,000 or not, but if not, they were pretty damn close. Because that stadium, outside of what they blocked off behind the giant uh, stage, uh, looked pretty full to me. The main event of the show was Nia Jax. Four words that should never go together. Main event and Nia Jax. But here we are. Nia Jax one-on-one -on -one with Rhea Ripley for the Women's World Championship. Rhea got the big superstar entrance. I don't mean superstar entrance like they do at WrestleMania where they're wearing some kind of special costume or you know they have the band doing her song live. They'll save that for WrestleMania. That, that'll happen in Philly. All she had to do was walk out here and get a superstar reaction. She's the most over person on the entire show, or one of, one of the most over people on the entire show. Cody, Cody got a pretty loud reaction, and Seth did too. But her family was there. They said her parents were in the front row, and they showed them. She had like a dozen members of her family, I think, in the front row. Michael Cole mentioned that she started training at Riot City Wrestling in Adelaide at the age of 15. And look at her now. Ripley threw an early headbutt and then went for a Hurricane Rana that Nia did not go down for. Nia sort of awkwardly stumbled. Jax put Ripley down and hit her with a senton splash. Rhea avoided Nia's sit-down splash and she went for a move from the middle rope, but Nia caught her and powerbombed her twice. Ripley fought back and went to the top rope. She hit a missile drop kick. Ripley held Jax's arm and hit her with two clotheslines. She went for a third one, but Nia pulled her in and hit a Samoan drop. Ripley went to the ropes. She got cut off by Nia, who joined her on the ropes, and Nia put Ripley on her back and hit a Samoan drop from the middle rope and then covered Rhea for a near fall. Nia went to the ropes. Ripley slipped underneath her, put her on her shoulders in an electric chair position, and then dumped her face first onto the top turnbuckle. Rhea went up top did the Eddie Guerrero shimmy and then hit a frog splash. Only got her two. They ended up outside the ring, and Rhea tried to clear off the announce desk. She didn't do a very good job. She pulled off the lid, but all of the equipment and the, the sc little screens, everything was still there. And so I'm sure it didn't feel too good when uh, she attempted a powerbomb to Nia Jax, which is a very stupid thing to do. And it did not work. And Nia countered by putting Rhea on her back and then hitting a Samoan drop on top of the table and all of the debris on the table that she didn't clear off. Hit a Samoan drop, the table did not break. Naya sees this and says, this table must break. So she goes over and she stands up on one of the announcer chairs. And I'm holding my breath here because these chairs have wheels on them. And they're very unpredictable. And she's not always the most graceful person. She stands up on top of the chair. Her only, she didn't make a mistake. I mean, she basically dove off with an elbow and she broke the table. I think that she could have moved it a little bit closer because you could see like she gets up on the chair and there's a little bit of distance between the chair and the table. And she's looking at this probably thinking, oh shit, I should have moved this a little bit closer. But she went for it and she hit it and she did break the table finally. So I guess all's well that ends well. 
Jax got Ripley back inside and hit her Annihilator finish, sat down right on top of her. Ripley kicked out at two, I believe, becoming the first person to kick out of that move. I mean, this is what they've been protecting it for. They have been protecting it and protecting her. She beat Becky Lynch at the beginning of the year for this very moment to allow Rhea Ripley to be the one to kind of slay the dragon and be the first person to kick out of it and be the first person to beat her in a singles match. It's all been building to this. So we had Jax goes up top, which she never does. Why would Nia Jax go to the top? I'd be like Andre the Giant or Kevin Nash or somebody really tall who you never see on the top rope, climbing to the top rope. Someone who doesn't have aerial stuff as part of their typical move set. All of a sudden, she thinks, you know what? I'm going to climb to the top rope. And so, of course, that didn't work out very well for her. She got cut off. And Rhea went up there with her. She actually knocked her uh, off with a superplex and then threw a kick to the head. And then finally, she got her up for the riptide, pinned her, and Rhea Ripley is still your women's world champion. Everybody cheered. They showed Rhea's, Rhea's family in the front row and how happy they were. They gave her the pyro celebration. Rhea went outside. She sat on top of the barricade. With her family, her mother was looking up. I assume it was her mom. Her mom was looking at her, and she was like, oh, you know, it's my baby. So they were all celebrating together. Then Rhea got back in the ring one last time and posed for everybody. And so now we know it will be Rhea Ripley defending the women's world title of WrestleMania 40. She will do so against Becky Lynch. And it's going to be tough to top what Rhea did with Charlotte Flair at last year's WrestleMania because they had an excellent match. Just an excellent match. Uh, one of the best matches all year. But you know what? Becky Lynch has shown an aptitude for being able to go out there and have great matches too. And she's had a lot of them in her career. And she's had some at WrestleMania. In fact, two years ago against Bianca Belair, they had a tremendous match. And now you are taking two of the biggest female stars in the entire company, two of the biggest female stars in the country, in any of the, you know, certainly the uh, U.S. promotions, in Rhea Ripley and Becky Lynch, and you're putting them in the ring against each other for the very first time. That is a big match that is worthy of WrestleMania. In, in a division that really has not been all that strong, Rhea Ripley, the reason we don't see Rhea Ripley wrestling on TV very often is because who is there for her to work with? She had a match with Ivy Nile. She'll have a match here and there with somebody, but there's really no competition for her. She's been so dominant, right? She's physically imposing compared to some of the other women they have in that division who are tiny. But the way she has been booked, she has been booked so dominantly that unfortunately, the effect that it has on the division is because they have not really done a very good job on Monday nights of adding that many new people, certainly nobody that's gotten over in that women's division that there's really nobody else for her to work with. So the match had to be her and Becky Lynch. It's the match that makes sense. The question is, what do you do at WrestleMania? Because I, personally, me, I would have Rhea win at WrestleMania too. But then if she beats Becky at WrestleMania, what the fuck does she do? Who, who is after Becky Lynch? If Rhea Ripley and that title, pending a, an eventual draft, if they stay on Raw, who else is there for her to believably get in the ring and work a full program with? Who do they have? You've got Natalia. I mean, they got plenty of women on that roster. You've got Tegan Knox, and you've got Natalia, and you've got Zoe Stark, and you've got Shayna Baszler, and Caden Carter, and Katana Chance, like Chelsea Green. My God, I mean, you have these different women, but like, really? Honestly, you expect them to be positioned in a program against Rhea Ripley? Because I don't. You almost have to put the title on Becky. That's the position I feel like they put themselves in. You know, they've called up some NXT people recently. We don't know where Jade is going to land. Jade is probably going to end up on Raw. So, you know, Jade is probably going to be their pet project. They're going to, and they should, be very careful with her and not expose her weaknesses and try to focus on her strengths. But... She's a ways away, though, from being women's champion. Tiffany Stratton just debuted, but she's on SmackDown. She's not on Raw. 
Bianca Belair is on SmackDown. She's not on Raw. That could change, though. They have a draft in May, like they did last year. I could see Bianca potentially ending up back on Raw. You could do Bianca and Rhea at SummerSlam, right? Big title match there. So that's the problem that they face going forward as far as potential challengers for her if she comes out of WrestleMania and holds on to that title. But we're not at WrestleMania yet, so I'm not going to book the WrestleMania match just yet. The crowd in Perth, though, was hot all night. Uh, the wrestling was largely good on the show. Nothing that will stand out as uh, a match of the year I'm going to put on my list and come back to at the end of, of 2024. But I enjoyed the three and a half hours for the most part. There were some dead spots during the show, but if I had to you know, give the show a score, I, I would go in the range of seven to maybe seven and a half for this show. I think seven and a half is a fair rating for this show. Uh, nothing epically memorable, but I also think nothing epically uh, worth waking up at five o'clock in the morning, or if you're on the West Coast, two o'clock in the morning to watch. Uh, you could have slept in and watched this show, and it would have been fine. But uh, I enjoyed it overall. Let's take a look at the uh, poll here. We have our star ratings in the poll. With over 2,100 votes in, about 41% give this show four stars. And just shy of 40% give this show three stars. So almost neck and neck. 12% give it two stars, and 7.7% give this show one star. A one-star show? I don't know about that. I, I agree with the majority here. This was a, a three to four star show easily, in my humble opinion. Oh, the Judgment Day. You almost got me, but you didn't. Almost interrupted me there. Alex with the $32 Judgment Day Super Chat. Thank you very much. Thank you, bruh. Appreciate it. Four stars from people in the chat. Six out of ten. Yeah, I mean, look, that's, that's about in the range that I think that show is deserving of. I don't think we're really too out of step on that. All right, we got Bobbert Reviews here chiming in with the 45... Actually, I got to go back here because there were few that may not show up here so let me just make sure i'm not missing anybody let's make sure i'm not missing anybody hey boots again thank you for the hundred dollar super chat earlier boots coming in clutch actually yeah there are a bunch here so let me let me go through these first hey luis is with us luis who i know is out on the west coast says the scrolling text only works when the National Weather Service activates the emergency alert system. It does not work for pro wrestling. Uh, God of Seduction with the uh, two dollars. Interference in the chamber always feels weird. Well, AJ AJ Styles he trusts in the process and he knew that door was going to open and he was right. He flew all the way around the world knowing that it was going to open. Uh, Daniel Carlisto, thank you for the five. I'm saying it. That AJ spot should have gone to Karrion Cross on Bobby Lashley instead. No Karrion again, crickets. Because Karrion Cross had no business being on this show. Hopefully, Karrion Cross will be able to get himself over enough to a point where he'll be able to start making some PLE appearances. But no, Karrion Cross got his spot on SmackDown last night. He hurt the arm. They did the injured arm spot on SmackDown. You know, had Karrion Cross come out to go into the chamber here, nobody would have cared. This was to set up a WrestleMania match with AJ Styles and LA Knight. That's why it had to be AJ. If they were going to do that spot, it had to be AJ. That's why that made sense. Uh, Base Beer says, Nia against, against Lizzo at WrestleMania. Next celebrity feature match. Can she do a, uh, a Hura Kunrana? Can Lizzo do a Hura Kunrana? Uh, Winter Burgos, Nia looked great. Hope it's her against Jade at WrestleMania. You know, I could see that being the match. I could see that being the match. I think somebody mentioned that last night. I, I agree, I could see that. Uh, hey, Roscoe P. Coltrane. Thank you for the Super Chats, Roscoe. Now we catch up with Bobbert. Hopefully I didn't miss anybody. Hey, Flint, 
Flint says watching from Zimbabwe. We got people from all over the world who are watching. I usually don't go live at this time of day, so there are going to be people here who can't usually make the late night streams who are joining, so welcome to all of you. Got somebody here from Bahrain in the Middle East. Shout out to David. Bobbert says, can't wait for Monday Night Raw when R-Truth photoshops himself with Rhea's family after her match. Hey, Bobber, you're the first one to break in that new $45 one, so thank you for that. Skull Dipper 125 if Rock versus Cody happens on night one of Mania, do you see him going over both nights, or do you think he would go over one night and lose the other? I, I tend to believe that Rock would win if they do that singles match, and there'll be some uh, shenanigans and bloodline interference, but I think... It's kind of like Brett losing to Owen at the beginning of WrestleMania 10 and then coming back at the end of the night and winning the title. And that set up their eventual match at SummerSlam. I think Rock would go over. It really, a lot of it depends on the story they want to tell with Rock and Roman. You know, you could have Rock win night one, Roman loses night two, and that could be what leads to the rift with Rock and Roman. Roman maybe gets kicked out of the bloodline, right? That would be one way to go about doing it. So it really comes down to what what this story ends up being with Rock and Roman. You know, Roman on SmackDown last night took credit for uh, the plan to send Jimmy to Raw to cause Jay the match with Gunther the other night. And he was like, oh, that was my plan. I quarterbacked the plan. It was all me. Well, the way it came across, I don't think it was him. I think it was The Rock who may have been the one to call for that plan. And so you could see Maybe the beginnings of Roman not being very happy about Rock sort of usurping him as, as the leader of the bloodline. If they go forward with that singles match, I think Rock's going over. I think Rock is going over, and I think part of the reason also that he would go over is the bloodline would cost Cody the match, and that would be the story going into night two. Cody can't do it, but he just can't do it. It's too much, you know. Seth Rollins said he'll watch his back. Maybe Drew McIntyre goes out there and attacks Seth and takes him out of the equation. Cody ends up getting screwed. You go into night two thinking, this guy's got no chance, right? That's what they want you to think. And it'll make the big win that much more, uh, you know, that much more enjoyable, I guess, if you're a Cody fan, when he finally does beat the bloodline and win the title. So Rock, I think, would win that match. Uh, the real CSO2. Did you see Bronson's tweet on why he was not on the PLE? Uh, not only did I see it, I talked about it at the beginning of the stream. So yes, I did. Richie says, you think Rhea Ripley's uh, shoe would make a lot of money on eBay since she drank, fr she drank from her shoe. Did that happen off the air? Uh, don't tell Rumple Maine. I think he might pass out. And to answer your question, yes, if she takes that shoe and puts it on eBay, she will fetch quite a uh, quite a penny. Richie, thank you again. Alex says, are there any U.S. cities that WWE will never host any show due to whatever reason? Uh, Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> Jackson, I, I don't know. They used to stay away from uh, Portland for years because of the, uh, the commission. I guess the, the commission there or the drug testing there. But I mean, as far as today, <clears throat> I don't know. I, I, would, I would think not. I would think there were certain places that they... Maybe they would avoid because there's just not a big enough arena for them to run. But otherwise, I, why would you want to shut any state out? Oh, it was at the press conference. She drank from her shoe at the press conference? Oh, man. Oh, boy. Carlos, did WWE convince you, like they did me, to take a vacation in Perth or what? Yeah, they had tons of video packages. Well, they do that with the Saudi shows, too. It's kind of part of the deal. You know, you got to talk about the great places to visit because they're trying to make them tourist destinations. All I heard from some people, though, coming into this show is that Perth is like in the middle of nowhere. and They're not even sure why they did the show in Perth. I take it that's not really like a popular destination just based on where it is. 
but they were really trying to they were trying to convince you to take a trip down to australia i i feel like i would love to go down there one day it's just it's just too long of a fucking flight it says great show and tiffany stratton is a future megastar thank you solo uh tiffany and Braun breaker are going to be both megastars they're going to do very well on that main roster sam rizza coming in with five gifted memberships on the channel here I like how Tom and Nick Mysterio is one of our new channel members now, thanks to Sam. Tom and Nick are now here on the channel. <laughs> uh, Holiday197 with the $9 Super Chat. Expected a setup with the Grayson segment after Roman called Grayson in for a chat on SmackDown. This went nowhere and no Rock or Roman. Unless Grayson is being involved in Roman and Rhodes for some reason. No, he's not. It served no purpose. They just wanted to get you thinking that something was going to happen and get you to tune in early for the show. Otherwise, that was a waste of time, is what that was. Uh, JP. I overslept and I missed the start of the stream, so I guess I'll start from the beginning. At least, at least I can do... <laughs> do that here unlike on peacock seriously i don't know what the fuck i don't know why you can't when you start a live ple if let's say you're 45 minutes in you're an hour into a four hour show why can you not rewind back to the beginning that is the most unbelievably stupid thing that i have ever seen their ui is bad enough right everything's by season season this season that searching like their UI fucking sucks. If I didn't have WWE on Peacock, I would have absolutely no reason to maintain a Peacock subscription. None. Absolutely none. The worst of the fucking streaming services that I have a subscription for is Peacock. They put the cock in Peacock. But yeah, JP, you can rewind this stream anytime you want to and start from the very beginning. Uh, Base Beerus. You know what the weird thing was about that when I tried? When I initially came into the show and I tried to rewind? I have my eyes, like, I'm, like, squinting. The volume is muted. I'm squinting so I don't accidentally see something. But I could see the bar where you can scrub. And I take my finger and I try to scrub backwards. And it lets me go back by, like, 30 minutes. Which is not the beginning of the show. I said, what's the fucking point of that? So I can go backwards, but just not to the beginning. What is the purpose of that? It's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. <sighs> Base Beerus, Elimination Chamber, starring Rhea Ripley. Basically, yeah, that's basically what it was. Uh, Lakers Pat says, grow your hair out like Dom Dom. Man, I wish, I wish... I wish I could. I would if I could, but I can't, so I won't. Uh, Orhan, only heel Orton can make Cody's reign compelling. Well, if Cody wins the title, you can absolutely build to Cody and Randy at SummerSlam. I said months ago, you can headline SummerSlam with that, or you can co-headline SummerSlam. You could do Cody and uh, Randy, and then whatever you're going to do, maybe with Rock and Roman, like... Absolutely. If they don't do Cody and Randy at some point, it's booking malpractice. I mean, why wouldn't she? Why wouldn't she do that match? Uh, Chris P. Bacon. Chris P. Bacon. Congrats on 850 episodes. Hell of a run. Thank you. It's not over yet. But episode 850 is coming up tomorrow. So tune in. Mr. AJ Allday, uh, thank you for the 20. Uh, decent pay-per-view, enjoyed both chamber matches. Rhea did her thing. I joined the pay-per-view after the women's chamber and was able to rewind on my PlayStation. Thanks for all you do. Side note, R-Truth was the US champion at one time. I have no memory of that, but thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, I tried to rewind on my app on the phone and on the computer. I don't have a PlayStation, so I can't try on the PlayStation. 
but I tried it two different ways. It would not allow me to rewind to the beginning. So I don't know what to tell you. I tried, it didn't work. Orhan, how do you think Moxley would have done in WWE right now? He says, I miss him. But he's not dead. All you gotta do is change the channel. You can watch him every, every week. Cutting himself open. Like I did. Um, how would he be doing right now? I think he'd be doing well. He'd be positioned, you know, towards the top of the card, and I think he'd be in the mix. I think all the S.H.I.E.L.D. guys would always be protected. Had he stayed, and even if he goes back at some point, you know, and he won't have to deal with Vince McMahon if he does, all those S.H.I.E.L.D. guys, if, like, if, had he stayed, they were always going to be positioned in a very good spot. So if Moxley was to eventually go back to WWE, he'd be a main eventer. Uh, Mr. 201 says, I noticed Royal Rumble and now Elimination Chamber had four or five matches. Do you think WrestleMania 40 will have a small amount of matches each night? I hope so. I, I don't want them to fill both nights with too many matches. That's the whole point of having two nights. So you can avoid that. And not have four and a half or five hours of matches that you have to rush through and you know the show goes long and people are tired that's the benefit of working two nights i mean otherwise why the hell are you bothering doing two nights for like i don't remember how many matches they had each night last year if it was six uh six or seven to me that's a that's a fine number six or seven matches each night of wrestlemania you end up with 12 to 14 total between the two nights i think that's perfect i think that's the sweet spot right there But yeah, Triple H has a, uh, a tendency to not overbook these shows in terms of the number of matches. And that was something that he did in NXT with the TakeOver shows. There were very few TakeOvers that I remember that had more than five matches. There might have been some that had six, but usually it was like five. Or like in that range and no more than that. And that was part of the reason I think why people enjoyed those shows so much. It wasn't just that the matches were all bangers, right? They were, but... The shows never felt long. They never were exhausting to sit through. And that's one of the reasons why people enjoyed them so much. I, I am of the belief, like if I were booking, if I were in Triple H's spot, I would do what he does in that I would r much rather give people just barely enough or maybe even have them feel like, oh man, I can't believe they like that. It's it, it's over. Just leave them wanting more as opposed to giving them too much, and they kind of grab their stomach and feel sick, like, oh, I, I overate. You know that feeling when you overeat, right? It's like the worst feeling, like, ah, oh, shit, you know, I eat too much. I'd much rather have people, like, waiting for more, wanting to tune in next time to see more. Just leave them wanting more. That would be my booking philosophy. Don't give them too much. Especially when you have 52 weeks a year to book. You got shows every week. You got three hours of Raw. You got two hours of SmackDown. Shawn Michaels does his own thing with NXT. Yeah, but Triple H is overseeing five hours a week of live television. I mean, come on now. You got to spread this shit out a little bit. Alex, with that $32 Judgment Day super chat says with situations like this where you have live streams multiple times in a span of a couple of days uh in addition to your sunday podcast how do you mentally and physically prepare thank you for the amazing content <laughs> Physic physically i just don't get any sleep that's really what it is i tried to i didn't that's why i didn't wake up at five i'm like dude I, you know by the time i go to bed on a night where i stream it's already like at least two o'clock in the morning i said i gotta sleep in a little bit Otherwise, I would have tuned in at 5, and I wouldn't have had that issue with Peacock. But in my mind, I'm like, all right, it's fine. If I wake up at 6.30 or 7, I'll just rewind, and then I got fucked. That's that's the only reason why the stream went up an hour later. I would have been ready to go at 12 had I been able to watch the fucking show. But anyway, um, yeah, I just I, I barely get sleep, which is not good. Don't do that. Don't deprive yourself of sleep. Um... It's a lot. I mean, there's just... The, this year so far has been so crazy. Like, there's just so much going on. Um, that it's been nice the last, like, 
week or two things have kind of died down a little bit but i just know that they're gonna get crazy again wrestlemania season's always crazy and you know you just got to find a balance so you don't burn yourself out you burn yourself out you're not going to be of any use to anybody but my god i mean there's just been so much news and so much stupid tweets to talk about and so much going on overall in the world of wrestling across multiple promotions uh, that it's overwhelming. I mean, that one week leading up to the Rumble, I did like three sound offs that week. <laughs> we went from like 844 to 45 to 46 in the span of a week. It's crazy. Chris Mikesell, the women have been having better gimmick matches lately, Royal Rumble, and now Elimination Chamber. Do the men need to step it up? Is it the match placement? Uh, what needs to improve? I don't think match placement has anything to do with it. You can't blame the women for going on first. You just got to go out there and have a better match. The women's Royal Rumble, I thought, at least being there live, I had the live perspective, was more fun than the men's Rumble was. And that's with all of the botches and everything that absolutely was in the women's Royal Rumble this year. There were a lot of wonky moments. It was still the better of the two Royal Rumble matches. And as far as Elimination Chamber, I would say it was a lot closer. They were they were kind of neck and neck, but uh, I give the edge to the women. Yeah, I mean, what do the men have to do? Just go out there and have a better match. Step up your game. Why well, I say competition's good for everybody. Uh, CJ Ball, it's like when uh, NXT, the black and gold, right? When they were showing up the main roster all the time. And they would have a takeover event the night before a big pay-per-view. And you knew going in, like, they were going to blow it out of the water. And it's like, if you're on the main roster, you're watching that, probably thinking, man, I, shit, I got to step up my game now, right? Can't get showed up by the NXT crew. It's the same concept. CJ says, Salamaster, thank you for all the entertainment you provide. My five-year-old loves falling asleep to your podcasts. Well, I'm glad it can be a sleep aid. I've heard that, actually, from multiple people. I'm not offended though. I I see that as a good thing. See, I'm I'm helping I'm helping parents all over the world by putting their children to sleep. Thank you, CJ. Uh, Richie says even Seth Rollins, who is champion, had to beg Cody Rhodes to challenge, and Seth seems more concerned about Cody than worrying about his opponent at WrestleMania. He does, doesn't he? He does seem a little too overly concerned about Cody. But now he knows who his opponent is going to be. The thing is, like, he's been hurt, so he hasn't really been on television doing much. And we didn't know who his opponent was going to be. It was going to be CM Punk. And then they had to go a different way. Now his opponent is locked in. So now he needs to focus more on Drew McIntyre, a little bit less on Cody Rhodes. But thank you, uh, Richie, for the $5. I appreciate that very much. Solo Monster is for the children. Boy, we've come a long way from those days of uh, fuck them kids, huh? Well, I guess we all, we all grow up, I guess. Ted Evans, thank you for the five gifted membership. We've got a bunch of new members on this channel today so far. I like seeing it. I like seeing all this green. This is great. Gabriel Lopez, congrats on your new membership. What is the point of Drew against Seth? I really don't get it. The point? What do you mean, what is the point? The point is that Drew McIntyre is obsessed with being the World Heavyweight Champion again and getting the moment at WrestleMania that he feels he was deprived of all those years ago. And CM Punk was going to get the match. CM Punk got hurt on account of Drew. Drew now has taken his spot and is going to say to CM Punk, I'll show you how it's done. That's the story. I, I don't know what's that hard to understand. I mean, is it a, a, a repeat match that we've seen before? Yeah, that's a fair point. But I think the, the story of it seems pretty obvious to me. Uh, Zay97. 
with the $5 super chat from earlier. Assuming Priest cashes in successfully, how long does he hold the title? I say under 60 days. I tend to agree. I think if Damian Priest does cash in uh, for that title successfully, I don't think he's going to have it for very long. I think you're right. I think he's going to try to cash in at WrestleMania. That's what I think he's going to try to do. Uh, we got rocks as... We got rocks. I don't know what... Rocks as... Vanitas. Thank you for the five. Buy or sell reigns that elevate mid-card titles. John Cena's U.S. Open Challenge or Gunther's current intercontinental title reign. Well, both of them are sort of the uh, the gold standard in this company. Cena's was, was more fun to watch because you never knew who was going to step up each week. Uh, it could be somebody lower on the card who you know gets to go out there and work with John Cena and have a breakout match. And, and he had a lot of fun matches during that reign. But the U.S. title was not uh, down in the dumps like the Intercontinental title was. The U.S. title was on Rusev, who was booked actually pretty strong. And then Rusev lost it to Cena. Cena started the Open Challenge. The Intercontinental title had nothing going for it until Gunther got a hold of it and they booked him as strong as they did. And the run that he has been on has been fantastic. And the Intercontinental title now has more value in the eyes of the fans because of who holds it than it has had in decades. Not a decade. Decades. That's the difference between what Gunther has done and what John Cena did for the U.S. title. Both great. Gotta go with Gunther. Buy on that. Sell on Cena. That's the big difference between the two. Uh, Donovan. I don't know why some of these didn't show up, but uh, anyway, Donovan D. Says, how can they get LA Knight hot again? He has cooled off a lot since the summer. His pops are not the same. Well, the bloom is off the rose a little bit because he got beat by Roman Reigns. And we all knew he was going to get beat by Roman Reigns. And they really haven't done anything with him since. They really didn't have a good plan for LA Knight. How about that? Coming out of the loss to Roman Reigns. What also hurt is that Randy Orton came back. Bigger star. CM Punk came back. Bigger star. All of a sudden, all the excitement was focused on that and not on LA Knight. So now LA Knight is over. He's popular. But yeah, his pops are not quite as loud as maybe they were before. Now, can he get back to that point? Yeah, I think he could. That's one of the reasons why I was hoping to see him and Logan Paul mix it up on the mic leading up to WrestleMania. Now it looks like that probably is not going to happen unless they make a multi-man match. So what do you do? You just get him involved with somebody that you know makes for a compelling feud. I don't really find him and AJ Styles compelling. I'm not saying they can't have a good match. I don't really find that compelling. So I don't think that's going to help his case. Like if you're looking for him to get back to where he was, like reaction-wise, like four or five months ago, this is not going to be the feud that does that. Uh, but I, I do believe that had they put him out there against Logan Paul, and they could always do it later on, uh, Logan is so hated. I think him going toe-to-toe -to -toe with him on the microphone, I think that could be what helps get him back there. I think he'd be the right opponent for him. And people would be dying to see him beat him. Take the title. Only title he's had so far, his entire WWE run, was in NXT. And that wasn't even an official title. That was the million dollar title that he had. But again, there's nothing wrong with the position he's in right now. If that was if that was his peak of popularity, and now he's sort of settled into a, like an upper mid-card slash main event position, that's not a bad place for him to be, right? He was the main event on SmackDown last night against Drew McIntyre. You know, just, I don't want to sit here and, you know, judge his failure or success on whether or not he becomes the world champion. I don't know that he's ever going to become WWE champion or world heavyweight champion. 
That doesn't mean that he's not successful. Think of where he was a year and a half ago and look at where he is now. And you're going to tell me that that is some sort of failure. Like when you look at it in those terms, I think that he's in a, uh, a very good position right now. Now he's just got to maintain it. Uh, KC1324, now that Sasha Banks is signed to AEW, do you think there will be anybody from the women's division to aid Bailey at WrestleMania 40? Well, I don't know that Naomi has uh, a spot. Naomi could step up and be an ally to Bailey, especially if Dakota Kai turns on her next week, which I think she will. She's going to need some friends, and we might see Naomi step up to back up Bailey. Corey Blake. Solo Sokoa is the only Bloodline member who does not have a match at WrestleMania. How does Solo against Braun Breaker sound? Ah, uh, that would be interesting. We we did see a little uh, meeting, didn't we, a few weeks ago backstage with Braun Breaker and Paul Heyman? So to have Braun go up against one of the members of the Bloodline would be kind of interesting. Um, I'm trying to remember if the two of them wrestled in NXT. I don't remember if Solo and Braun had a match if they worked together before. Um, Solo, I found Solo more, way more compelling in NXT than he has been the last like six months on the main roster. I mean, he has really cooled off. And his matches are kind of blah. You know, there's nothing wrong with them. But this gimmick that he's doing, the kind of the silent enforcer where he just stands there and doesn't really say anything. Um is getting really old. And so the quicker they can get to a point where Solo finally, you know, sees Roman for what he is and breaks away and kind of does his own thing, I think is going to be very beneficial for him because he actually was a much better character in, uh, in NXT. I want to get that Solo back. Solo and Braun would work, though. You know, the thing I pitched last night was, I don't know what Sheamus' status is going into WrestleMania, and if they get him back before Mania, you could do Sheamus and Braun. I think that'd be great, too. Uh, Mr. 201, we talked about that already. Okay, so Avatar. Avatar 1977. Drew winning due to multiple outside interference is great story evolution. I think it's leading to a WrestleMania win and then a cash-in from Damian Priest. Yeah, I, I think we're going to get that cash-in at WrestleMania. Drew gets his moment. He's so happy. The moment he was deprived of in front of people in 2020. And then Damian Priest ruins it for him. It would get him cheered, though. It would probably get Priest cheered. But, you know, if Priest cashes in and wins the title, he's going to be cheered anyway, probably. So, uh, Let me just make sure I didn't miss any of the old ones here. Any of the old ones. ABK, again, I'll give him another shout-out because fucking blew it out of the water, did ABK, with what I think is a uh, well over $400 bomb. Again, JM and Aaron, he's waiting. He's waiting on a response here. Fluffy Panda. We miss Fluffy Panda and uh, Thunder Force. Fluffy Panda says, How would you rank TNA's Giselle Shaw, AEW's Mariah May, and WWE's Tiffany Stratton? Shout out to the Panda family. I guess we do. We do have a... We have a budding panda family here on the channel. I'm not sure why, uh, but we do. So rank them. He's saying basically rank them as uh, as most promising. I haven't seen a lot of Giselle Shaw's work. I've seen some matches uh, that Giselle has had. I've seen a very limited amount of Mariah May's work from stardom, but I've been impressed by what I've seen from her. We, we really haven't seen her do anything yet in AEW, so it's hard to judge. Uh, right now, Tiffany Stratton is the one, to me, who has the most potential. I would go Stratton, Mariah May, and Giselle Shaw in that order. Thunder Force 2000, if John Cena and Roman Reigns were around the same age and came into WWE around the same time, who do you think would have been the bigger star? 
Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns. You could see what Vince McMahon fell in love with with this guy. He's got the size. He's got the look. He's got the hair. He just looked like a badass out there with the shield. He looked exactly like the kind of person that Vince McMahon would want to strap that rocket to and launch to the moon. So if he was given the choice between the two of them, I have no doubt in my mind his first choice would have been Roman Reigns. It's kind of like Batista ended up getting over as a big star. But you could see like Cena, Batista, they went with Cena as the face of the company. If it was Cena and Roman, I think it would have been the other way around. And I think Roman would have been the guy that they went with as the face and Cena would have been like in the Batista category. But then I think in the end, it would have ended up working out where Cena would have been the face regardless because Roman was not ready for that spot. That early in his career, that's a very different Roman Reigns than the one we see today. I think it would have ended up coming back around to Cena anyway. Uh, L.A. Bryan with a $10 super chat from earlier says, Sala Monster, how come WWE never did a Brock Lesnar versus Batista match? I felt they could have done that at WrestleMania 30, and then we could have gotten an Undertaker versus Cena match instead. Don't know. Stars just didn't align for it. Just didn't work out. It's kind of like, why didn't we get Rock and Shawn Michaels, right? Well, we know why, I guess. There, there is a reason why we didn't get that one. Um, but you can think back to certain matches that we should have gotten, and it's like, man, we never, we never did get to see that match. It kind of just falls into that category. I think the two of them... Now, they may have wrestled. I don't know, actually, that they never had a match. They may have had a TV match at one point early in Brock's career. If they did, I don't remember it. But as far as, like, once they made it as, like, bona fide main event players, why didn't we get the match? Timing. I mean, look, Lesnar left in 2004. Had he not have left, we would have absolutely gotten Brock and Batista. Brock left and he didn't come back for 12 years. Or eight years. I'm sorry, eight years. So that's a long time. By the time he came back, Batista had already retired. He left the company in 2010. So again, it's like two ships passing in the night. It just, they just kept missing each other and it just didn't work out. It's as simple as that. Shawnee and the wrestling. I think. Uh, let's see here. I think the way Randy sold his back was great. He may not be able to go like he used to, but he is still a God tier seller. It is definitely an art, a lost art. It is a lost art. Unfortunately. Kevin Miller, good to catch the sound off live. I'm in time. Kevin, good to have you. Shawnee also says, do you think it would be better to have Pat McAfee on SmackDown with Corey? Better heel face dynamic. And not going to lie, three hours of Pat is rough. I think two hours of Pat was the way to go. Uh, he is a little rough in longer doses. I'm just bummed they broke up Cole and Wade Barrett. You know, I thought they were a very good combo. So yeah, I, I probably would shuffle the deck a little bit. I agree. All right, so those are the older ones. And uh, Yukio Rules, random question. What happened to Dexter Loomis? Also, thank you for everything you do. Uh, you're very welcome. Yeah, what, what did happen to Dexter Loomis? He vanished off the face of the earth. I don't know what happened to Dexter Loomis. Uh, Daniel Malcolm, do you think a Rock LA interaction would do more damage or good for LA? Uh, more damage. All it's going to do is just, you know, Rock is going to bury him on the whole, like, you're trying to be me. and I, I don't really see that benefiting LA Knight in any real meaningful way. I think I would avoid that one. He's taking speech lessons. Yes, Dexter Loomis is, he's uh, learning to speak. All right, I think we're all caught up now. Uh, good shit. Very much appreciate it. The goal for Be The Booker here on this stream has been met, which is awesome. 
We are at 600 likes. Keep uh, running up the score there. I want to get that even higher. But right now, uh, let us go ahead and be the booker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to be the booker. Now, last night on the SmackDown stream, I thought that we had gotten our first clean sweep of the week where we got all bells for Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, which we did. And then you guys pointed out to me that I celebrated prematurely because we had one more live stream to go, which is this one. And I said, oh shit, you're right. You're right. I forgot about that. So, I hope I didn't jinx it. We're going to try to go four in a row on the live streams this week with these matches. I hope I can do it. I hope I can do it. Let's see. Tag Team Be The Booker, we begin with FTR. They used to be draped in gold. Now they have no gold. But this is a fine way to kick things off here. One of the best tag teams in the world. All eyes on Kareem. Yeah, that's right. There, there he is right there. There's the troublemaker right there. Kareem is the one who pointed it out. Teacher, teacher. You forgot to give us homework. Teacher, teacher. FTR going to be taken on. Oh, wait a minute here. Hold on. We landed on triple threat. So we have to add not one, but two teams. We're getting ourselves a three-way tag team match. How about that? How about that? All right. All right. FTR, we have Imperium. Ludwig Kaiser and Giovanni Vinci, the former NXT Tag Team Champions, as you can see there. So we have FTR. We have Imperium. I think we already know where this is going. I think we already know where this is going. They're going to be in there with the smoking guns, Billy and Bart. Not even the smoking guns can ruin that one. And to be fair, that even with the smoking guns in there, smoking guns were not terrible. There were some teams from back then that were pretty fucking terrible. The smoking guns were not terrible. There you go. That's a that's a quality three-way match there. And to think that Billy Gunn is still going. Billy Gunn is a champion in 2024. I don't know what Bart is up to, but Billy is still going. Okay, here we go. Women's time. Let's book ourselves a women's match. Be the booker. Here we go. We begin with Jordan Grace. The TNA Knockouts Champion, fresh off of her appearance last month in the Women's Royal Rumble. Another great start. Another great start. She was honestly the most impressive person in that entire Royal Rumble. Someone who didn't even work for the company. All right, Jordan Grace is going to go one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, no. Jordan Grace is going to go one-on-one -on -one with all red everything, Eva Marie. Oh, no. Eva Marie fucked it all up. Eva Marie was our downfall. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Kareem, this one's on you, buddy. This is all your fault. We were so close. We were so close. It was right there. It was in the palm of our hands. And we let it get away. <sighs> well, men's be the booker. We've got Muffin Man. There he is, straight from Mindy's. 
CM Punk. Did we have CM Punk last night? We had CM Punk last night in Be the Book. Although not with the muffins. CM Punk. What what an image. What an image. Amazing. Look at that stare. <laughs> Amazing. All right, let's see. CM Punk and his muffins are going to be headlining the show. He always wanted to headline WrestleMania. He gets the headline Be the Booker this year, not WrestleMania. CM Punk going to go one-on-one -on -one with Kenny Omega. Could have had that match. Could have had that match had things gone down a little bit differently, but that is a match that we will never, ever see. I am very, I am very sure of myself when I sit here and tell you that that is a match that we will never get to see. CM Punk against Kenny Omega. You couldn't get it in AEW, but you got it here and be the booker. Don't ever say I never gave you nothing. So there you go. It literally, Eva Marie ruined everything. I mean, it literally came down to one person other than Kareem who ruined everything. That's amazing. We had two bells in the other two matches. That's unbelievable. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Well, that, that, them's the breaks sometimes. I guess that's just the way it goes. Oh, man. Richie. Do I think The Rock and Randy Orton could have been a dream match? No. Like back back like back then? I I wouldn't have called that a dream match. But then again, I don't throw that word around for just any match. Everybody, everything these days is a dream match to everybody, right? It's like, eh, no, it's not. It's really not. Uh, but for me, no, I don't think so. And we have base beer. Now, today, if they were to do that match now, like if Rock was back for a proper short-term run and they did Rock and Randy, um, yeah, I mean, I, I might, I, I, I would look forward to that match, but I don't expect that to happen. And uh, we got Base Beerus who says, make it a squash match for Grace. People would buy it. I'm not booking squash matches, though, man. I'm trying to book the best possible matches I can. You're not going to book a squash match on pay-per-view. I'm sorry. That's, it's just, that's just the way it goes. There's nothing I can do. My hands are tied. My hands are tied. Every match is a dream match for Tony Khan. Isn't he doing uh, Brian Danielson and uh, Jun Akiyama on Collision tonight? I think that is an actual match taking place on Collision tonight. In 2024, Brian Danielson and Jun Akiyama. Uh, Tuxedo T-Servo. Has a, oh, wait, before that, Chris says, no flawless victory. Got that Kano heart. Rest in peace. Kano wins. That's right. Rips the heart right out of your chest. Love me some Mortal Kombat. Where is ABK? We need to change that women's. ABK, he came in. ABK, he shows up. It's like Austin. Arrive, raise hell, and leave. He already made his mark earlier. You missed him. He ain't coming back. Tuxedo T Servo has got a uh, super chat coming in. Oh, I had it paused. That's why. <laughs> but he's got a uh, seven dollar one coming in that he says is just for Kareem. You'll see it here in a second. Bundy against S D Jones was a squash match. Thank you. I I was not aware of that. Thank you. Doesn't change anything. It don't change nothing. Uh, who did I miss? I missed... Uh, let's see here. Let's see. Let's make sure I didn't miss anybody.
Joseph Brooks, buy, sell, rent on which TNA star you think should have had much more success in WWE than they did. Samoa Joe, Bobby Lashley, or Bobby Roode, rather. I'm sorry. Samoa Joe, Bobby Roode, or EC3? Uh, yes. That's my answer. Yes. All three. Of those names, though, if I had to pick one, if I had to buy on one, it's Samoa Joe. Buy on Joe, rent on Roode, and sell on EC3. But they all should have had more success than they did. With Joe and Rude, part of the problem, not the entire problem, part of the problem was their health, unfortunately. Uh, with EC3, they just fucked him over from day one. I mean, I don't know what else to say about that. Kareem with the two bucks says, all read everything. But Tuxedo gave you the ban from collision treatment. So Kareem is officially banned from collision. He is no longer welcome on that show. Uh, hey, Bobby's World, thank you for the gifted sub. That goes to Marco E. So congrats to him. And Zay97. I wonder if Seth and Cody are becoming friends now by teaming up so much lately. Poor Seth. Now they have to like each other. Bigelow should be in the Hall of Fame. Interesting you bring that up. There's a Hall of Fame question somebody sent in to me for the mailbag that is going to be part of tomorrow's show. Which uh, I will be recording in the morning. So, again, episode 850 of the podcast is yet to come on Sunday afternoon. So keep an eye out for that. Make sure you are subbed on all of the Appropriate feeds and places where you go to get your uh, podcasts. Make sure you do so. Come back to review Collision? No. I'm not going to do that. I have a show to prepare for for tomorrow. I, I, I have a, a threshold that I just can't exceed. <laughs> the number of shows and streams that I do. I have reached my limit for this week. I have reached my limit. I don't know why some of the other ones that didn't show up initially, but when I refreshed them in my dashboard, that's why I was able to get them. So thank you to all of those uh, individuals who sent some in earlier. Did Rude retire? Look at Richie Rich over here dropping all this money on me. Fahad hey, didn't retire. I just want you to know, I think you rock. I don't mean the rock, a rock, you rock. And I just wanted you to know that. Fahad certainly didn't retire. Fahad just dropped in with a honey bomb on me. Holy shit. Look at this. Fahad coming in late. He's coming in late. Fashionably late is uh, Fahad. I like it. And no message, too, man. Just dropping some love. I love it. I love it. Thank you, brother. We've got some more coming in. I'm going to let them cycle through. You guys are going to end up keeping me around until collision at this point. It's 316. It is exactly 316 p.m. Oh. It's Beth Phoenix, everybody. It's Beth Phoenix, still one of the funnier moments from a WWE pay-per-view. Just coming out, standing there, growling, making angry faces. That was a Royal Rumble, wasn't it? I thought that was the, I think it was the Royal Rumble one year. Was it the Royal Rumble in uh, 2022, maybe? I remember what year it was. Oh, man. I missed yours. Let's see. I don't know why it's all screwy today. It's all screwy. I don't want to miss Richie. 
Uh, la, 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 la. Richie, 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 Richie. Here we go. Richie with the $10 super chat. At this point, I feel like the world heavyweight champion that Seth Rollins, or the title that Rollins has, is pointless after Roman Reigns buried it to the ground. What he said is true. I feel like the IC title is more important than that title. I detect no lies in what you just said. I said the exact same thing after it happened. Super Pony, if we get Randy against Logan at WrestleMania, what does Kevin Owens do? I don't know. That's why I think it may end up ending up or end up becoming a multi-man match. And they work him in there. Because otherwise, I don't really know what he does at WrestleMania. I really don't. Uh, we have got... Bahad, man, again, thank you. We got Rox as... What is, I, I keep saying that name wrong. I'll call you Rox. How about that? Rox with the five bucks. Now that Randy is a legend... Who should be his legend killer? I think Carmelo Hayes could do it. Carmelo Hayes, Braun Breaker, either one of them. Hayes would work, though. Hayes is a heel now. Hayes would work. They call him up as a heel. Hey, Base Beerus, again, with the $90 Beth Phoenix. This is my favorite super chat. Can we see that shirt? I thought it was a Judgment Day shirt that you ha got off of K-Quick. And he says... Point at that sign, damn it. There it is. There's the WrestleMania sign. Uh, the shirt, again, well, it's Ghostface. It's go you can't see the entire thing, but it's it's Ghostface with the with the knife. And he is putting the knife through a giant uh pumpkin. But I thought that, you know, given the whole theme of the show, we we would go with the purple ghostface shirt. Right, you gotta you gotta be color coordinated for these things. <clears throat> uh, Richie says, "Do you think any men would drink out of Rhea's shoe?" Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of men who would drink out of Rhea's shoe, among other places they would drink out of. Uh, Base Beerus says, "Steve is technically a solo artist." Oh, my God. <laughs> Talking about Steve Mello. Who I think is with us, or at least I know he was before. Steve, I know Steve was in the chat at some point. But he says that Steve is technically a solo artist. There you go. That's uh, Bass Beerus. Being thrown out of the club by security for that one. Thrown out on his ass. <laughs> oh boy all right well i think i got you all thank you very very much it's good to see some of you with me live who aren't always able to join live it's good to see chris who just subscribed to the channel hopefully he didn't just miss the entire stream but if he did you can rewind it and go back and watch from the beginning unlike on peacock fuck peacock I'm going to be back with you for episode 850 not on youtube but episode 850 of the podcast tomorrow uh, got a lot of news to talk about, and uh, I think what I'll also do is uh, I am planning on going through uh, not every category in them, but the Observer Awards were out, and there are still an inordinate number of people who think that Dave Meltzer just votes on the awards himself. That's not how it works. But there were some interesting results in some of those awards categories, so we'll go through some of those on the podcast tomorrow as well. And the next time I am live with you is Monday night. Uh, for the post-elimination chamber Monday Night Raw recap. We got two more live streams here in February. We are already at the biggest February ever in the history of this channel. Now I just want to run up the score. So come on back on Monday and Wednesday and let's uh, close out the month in a big way. And then we'll kick off the month of March with The Rock uh, back on SmackDown coming up on Friday. Until then, be well, stay safe, thank you. Everybody's saying thank you. Thank you. Appreciate all of you. And uh, I will see you back here on Monday for more sound off on YouTube. Until then, take care, guys.
Oh, we got one more. We got one more. We got one more. HBKC83, I didn't forget about you. I didn't forget about you. I almost forgot about you. Because this is all screwed up. Uh, but HBKC83 had a super chat. Is the RKO the most protected finisher of all time? I don't know if it's the most protected finisher. It is definitely one of the most protected finishers of all time. And it also is one of the best because you can hit it on anybody, no matter how big or small they are, and it always gets a big pop every single time. And you know who he can thank for it? DDP. He needs to be cutting a check to DDP. A royalty check for taking that move. But yes, it is definitely among the best finishers uh, that I could think of. So there you go. I didn't want to leave you hanging. So there you go. HBK, thank you very much. I'll see you guys next time. Fuck him.